Grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. As you are probably aware, uh, today, this evening, most of the entire sports world will be focused on Minneapolis, Minnesota for the Super Bowl. But you might not be aware that uh, at this point next week, a week from today, most of the uh, sports world will be instead focused on Pyeongchang, South Korea, as the Winter Olympics begin uh, next Sunday. My wife and I, we love watching the Olympics every time they roll around, both the Winter and the Summer Olympics. We like to watch in the Winter Olympics, we like to watch the figure skating, uh, the short and long track speed skating, the downhill uh, ska skiing. We've even been known to watch curling from time to time. We love watching the Olympics. Of course, we like the Summer Olympics a little bit more because there's always more events, more competitions. But these Olympics that roll around every uh, couple years will be focused on starting uh, next week. Somebody else uh, actually more than likely watched the Olympics at some point in his life, the Apostle Paul. Now, we don't know that for sure that he actually watched the, the Greek Olympics. It's not recorded in the Bible per se. We don't have anything in history that says that he, he did actually watch them. But he lived in a time where the Greek Olympics were extremely popular. And we can almost guarantee that he probably watched, not, maybe not the Greek games, but he watched another compar comparable set of games called the Isthmian Games. You see, the Isthmian Games were centered in the town of the city of Corinth. The Isthmian Games, it refers to this uh, uh, isthmus means this uh, narrow strip of land that connected Corinth uh, to, the, uh, to Greece. And on this strip of narrow land, they had these Isthmian Games every two years uh, in the spring. And uh, we know that uh, Paul uh, stationed himself in the city of Corinth right around the year uh, 50 to 52 A.D. And we know that the Isthmian Games took place in the spring of 51. So Paul was in Corinth when these Isthmian Games, uh, these Olympic Games, uh, took place. And so he probably had an opportunity to get to see the festivities, to see uh, all the competitions. But Paul was in Corinth for another reason. You see, when, when the Isthmian Games came around, thousands on thousands of people would descend upon that region, upon the city of Corinth, much like these past few weeks as thousands of people have descended upon Minneapolis, Minnesota for the Super Bowl. As these people descended upon Corinth, uh, Corinth didn't have big skyscraper hotels to accommodate all the travelers and all the guests. Instead, those who were visiting Corinth for the games would uh, encamp in the surrounding uh, fields next to the stadiums in tents, temporary tent dwellings. And guess who just happens to be a tent maker by trade? The Apostle Paul. So as he's in, Corinth, in the city of Corinth, he's able to be there, and he's got his companions, Priscilla and Aquila, who also make tents. And it's a perfect opportunity, as thousands of people are there for the games, it's a perfect opportunity for him not only to do his trade of making tents, but the more important work for him was sharing the gospel. As those thousands of people gathered there to, to gather around those games, he was able to share that gospel. And it's also not a surprise to us then that Paul actually uses athletic competition or these games as an illustration uh, for the Christian faith. I want you to turn with me uh, in your bulletins to page 4, this epistle reading of his letter to the Corinthians. On page 4 of your bulletins, uh, towards the bottom of the page, verse uh, 24. Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. 
So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. It's not a surprise that Paul hits those Corinthians right where they were at. They were so familiar with these Isthmian games and that competition, and Paul uses that as an opportunity to talk about the Christian faith. The Isthmian games, much like the, the games of Greece, had all kinds of uh, competitions. They had uh, long distance and short distance foot, foot races. They had wrestling and boxing, the javelin throw and the discus throw, chariot races. The Isthmian games even had poetry and singing. Can you imagine that? Aggressive poetry. <laughs> Competitive singing. But that was part of their games. That would have been kind of exciting to watch, I think. And so they would compete. Well, here Paul talks about a foot race. He says, don't you know that all those who run in this race, they all compete for the same goal, the same prize, but only one can finish as the winner. See, unlike today's uh, modern Olympics, in our modern Olympics, you can win first or second or third prize, and you get a bronze or gold medal, a silver medal, or bronze medal. But in those days, it was one winner. Whoever crossed the finish line first was, was crowned as the winner. And they didn't get medals like they do today. In the Olympic Games, the ancient Olympic Games, they were crowned with a, a crown of laurel wreaths. In the Isthmian Games, they were crowned with withered celery. So I guess you would say today, the, uh, we would say today's Olympics, we would say go for the gold. Back in those days, it was go for the greens. Um, go for the greens. Uh, only one winner would receive that championship crown, that, uh, that award. Now, Paul is not making an illustration here to say that you and I, as we run this race of the Christian faith, that we are competing with each other. That's not his point. His point is that we are indeed racing. We are running a race with perseverance. We are running a, this race. And Paul would be clear with us, as we understand, that you and I are not going to win this race based on anything that we do. We're not competing because of our good works. For you and I know, just as Paul knows and knew, that, that uh, very often we stray off a course. We're not perfect in the way in which we live our lives. And many times we are distracted by the things of this world and we veer off of the trail we should be running on. And, and many times we are in, engulfed with our own sinful passions and desires. No, we know our own sinfulness. And we are not running a race as somehow trying to be good people as somehow to earn something. Because Christ has already given us the victory. Christ has already given us this crown, this award. Because Christ himself ran the race in our place. Christ led that perfect life that you and I cannot lead. He never strayed off course. And in the end, as he crossed the finish line, his hands were lifted high. Not lifted high in victory, but lifted high and nailed to a cross. Though Jesus kept the race perfectly, ran that race perfectly, on the cross he got the punishment that our sins deserve. On the cross, Jesus got the agony of defeat of our sins so that you and I could know the thrill of his victory as he overcame sin and death rising from the grave. And because of his death and resurrection, Jesus, out of grace and out of love, has given us his victory. It belongs to us right here and now. and It has nothing to do with us at all. And he has given us this crown of victory. Not a, a crown of laurel leaves or celery that withers and spoils. Not 
not a, a, a metal, a gold or bronze or silver that eventually will tarnish and lose its luster. Not fame and fortune that is here today and gone tomorrow. No, he has given us a crown that lasts forever. Not a perishable crown, but an imperishable crown. The crown of forgiveness, eternal life, and resurrection on the last day. Christ has given us the victory. The game, the, the race is already won, and he waits for us at the finish line. And yet, we still run. We still run this race of faith. So knowing that victory is already ours, how do we as God's people, how do we as Christians run this race that's marked out for us? How are we to live? What are we to do? Paul would say, every athlete exercises self-control in all things, and they discipline their bodies, keeping it under control. One of the things we've always, I've always enjoyed when I watch the Olympics is hearing all the stories of these athletes. I think about how these athletes, whether they're Olympic athletes or any other athletes, think about all the training they have to undergo. Not just training to get stronger or to get faster, but training so that they can control their minds and their bodies, so that their minds and bodies will function the way they need to at the time of competition. They do the same activities, the same routines, the same behaviors over and over and over again. That's what training is. It's repetition. Today we would call that muscle memory. Muscle memory is when you train your, your muscle to act a certain way through repetition. So much so that it gets to the point where you no longer have to tell your arm to do this or your leg to do that. It just does it because it's trained. It has muscle memory. And so that's what these athletes do. Over and over again, they train themselves for this uh, competition. Think of all the hours, all the days, all the weeks, all the months, all the years that Olympic athletes undergo training so they can compete. Michael Phelps, who's perhaps probably the most renowned uh, Olympian, uh, obviously a swimmer, once talked about his training schedule. He would swim five to six hours a day and then spend another one to two hours a day in stretching or lifting weights. And he did that six days a week. Now that's commitment towards a goal. But commitment, commitment that requires self-discipline. Commitment that requires self control. You see, discipline means to repeatedly do those things you know you should be doing, but also at the same time refusing to do those things that will get in the way of you achieving your goal. And that, of course, is not easy. I can imagine many athletes have a hard time saying no. Say no when the alarm clock goes off at 4 o'clock in the morning and, and resisting the urge to just simply roll over and go back to sleep. Are those athletes that have a hard time uh, saying no when that temptation is to skip the workout or to just kind of cut corners or to just kind of go through it lackadaisically? Or the athlete that has to say no to that temptation uh, to eat the cheeseburger the large milkshake, the bag of chips, the box of cookies, the big gulp, and instead eat the healthy stuff that helps them as they compete. Discipline. It takes self-control. It's true for athletes, and it's also true for God's people. Just as an athlete trains their body through discipline and through self-control, so we as God's people... As we run this race of faith, we discipline ourselves, we practice self-control. That means, that means saying no. Saying no to the temptations of the flesh that would have us get involved in things that are outside of God's word. It, 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 means, it means saying no to those distractions that this world offers that would lead us astray. It means saying no to that temptation to, 
to not be about what God wants us to be about, sharing the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. That self-control that's needed to, to discipline our bodies, to discipline our lives as we run this race. And here's the thing. We can't do it. We don't have the ability within ourselves to lead self-controlled lives because we have that sinful nature. But the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And the Holy Spirit gives us the fruits of our faith. And one of the fruits of faith is self-control. The Holy Spirit helps us to control our sinful urges. The Holy Spirit helps us to control ourselves so that we are doing the things that God wants us to do and refusing to do those things that would distract us from our goals. So how does the Holy Spirit train us? Well, quite simply, through the means of grace. Through baptism, God's Word, and the Lord's Supper. When we return to that baptismal font, and remember that living water of our baptisms, as we return to that baptism over and over again, and remember and rejoice that we are baptized children of God, our race of faith began in that water. As we remember that, as we celebrate that over and over again, we are enabled to be disciplined disciples. And as we open God's Word, the Scriptures, the Bible, and we read the Bible ourselves, and we read and study that Bible with our spouses, and we share that with our families and home devotions, and we gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we read through the Bible, and we hear that Bible in worship, the more and more we study the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit enables us to be disciplined disciples. And as we gather in worship with our family of faith and we hear God's word and those times we gather at this altar and receive Christ and his body and blood, our sins are forgiven, our faith is strengthened, and the Holy Spirit works, enabling us to be disciplined disciples. The Apostle Paul says, let us run with perseverance this race marked out for us. The victory is already assured. Christ is risen and Christ has given us his victory. But we still have this race to run. And the Holy Spirit enables us to run as disciplined disciples. Paul would say in his letter to Titus, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of our great God and Savior. God's grace, through Christ, through his death and resurrection, gives us the strength, the ability to run with patience this race marked out for us until that day of the glorious appearing of Christ when Christ comes back and stands here upon this earth and all those who have run the race of faith before us, all those who are running right now with us, and those who will run in the future, all will gather on the other side of the finish line and we will rejoice and we will celebrate Christ's victory together. But until we get to that point, by God's grace, we run the race, the race marked out for us. And we run this race as disciplined disciples. Amen. May the peace of God which transcends all our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.